So if I'm not mistaken, we stopped with the diffraction rating last time. Okay. So what we're going to do today is just uh, continue on. on the remaining, uh, we could say, item in the uh, chapter. And uh, So the next one, uh, we have already, we could say, discussed this uh, polarization last time, okay? So when we're talking about uh, polarization of light, uh, it's considered what occurs uh, when we have two plane polarized uh, waves of identical frequency moving through the same all orientations uh, perpendicular to the other. So if you're going to look at yung electromagnetic uh, radiation natin, they are unpolarized. So they spread in different directions. Okay? So if we want to make it into what we call polarized, we have to what we call pass it through a polarizer. So if you want it So at least make a pick uh, ano, Rodel. <laughs> Original or PDF. <laughs> because uh, if I look at it at Amazon, medyo mahal. But I know, okay, there's a way to get that as a PDF copy. So if you can get a copy of it much, much better. Okay? Kasi halos lahat yan available na sa PDF eh. Kaya hindi na nakita yung uh, tinatawag nating libro, yung mga book company because of almost everything is already available. Okay? So, uh, when we talk about uh, polarization, so it's just like uh, making the light, we could say, uniform, okay? So if you're going to look at the vibrational planes that we have, we have infinite number of that, but we can do it into two major planes by vector addition. So pwedeng ganito or ganito. So if we polarize the light, all you need to do is propagate it. So if I pass it the, through polarizer, so everything will be in this direction. If it's through this one, in this what we call direction. So when the amplitude of the vectors becomes unsymmetrical, the radiation is polarized and the elimination of all but one plane results in plane polarization. So if we're talking about plane polarized, that means the electrical field vector vibrates in a single plane and the magnetic field vector vibration another plane. So usually if you elect electromagnetic radiation yung isa ganito I think sa plane na to tapos yung isa ganito sa plane. Okay? So th there is what we call plane uh, polarization. So if we're going to look at this uh, polarization of light we consider uh, what of course when we have two plane polarized light waves of identical frequency, frequency moving through the same region of space in the same direction. So if the electric field vectors of the two waves are aligned with each other, they will combine to give a resultant wave that is also linearly polarized. So we look at the amplitude. Okay and the phase of the resultant. Uh, it depends on the amplitude and phase of the two superimposing waves. So if the electric field vectors of the waves are mutually perpendicular, uh, the resultant may or may not be linearly polarized. 
Now, if the waves okay, are of equal amplitude and orthogonal superposition can lead to plane polarized, elliptical polarized, and circular polarized radiation. And which of these is obtained depends on the phase difference between the two waves as discussed below. So these are, we could say, the different types of polarization. So I'm trying to find uh, some sort of like a cartoon of it moving. Okay, so you could see the what we call polarization. I was able to find it, but unfortunately, hindi ko na siya makita. Okay, so that you will see how they are what we call different from one another. So I'll try to see. So here, I'll try to share to you how they move. Let me share. Can you see it? Nakikita nyo ba? Class? Okay. So we have here the linear polarization, the circular polarization, and uh, what we said, the elliptical uh, polarization. Okay. So it, it, we're going to, to look at what we call the linear polarization as we see here. As it's moving, we consider there's two waves that are uh, uh, with mutually perpendicular electric field vector. Now, if the two waves okay, have a phase difference that is zero or an integral multiple of plus or minus two pi, they are in what we call in phase and the resultant wave is linearly polarized as shown in this uh, what we call uh, animation. Or I can show you the figure when you have a polarized thing like this one. Okay, so you have what, two waves there. So so where are these what we call two waves that we have here? So this one and this one, okay? So if the two waves have a phase difference that is what we call zero or an integral of plus or minus two pi, they are going to be in phase and you're going to have a linear arise, polarized, uh, what, a linear polarization as we call it. Okay, so if we have uh, a linear polarized uh, light of resultant E as seen here, as seen here, okay, uh, to be composed of two orthog orthogonal components. So the component with the amplitude E raised to the Y, so you see the Y here, and uh, it's polarized with the YC plane. So where's the YC plane? This and this, okay? And the amplitude of the EX, it's going to be polarized with the XC plane. So X and C plane. So ito yung XY, ito yung uh, what we call YC. Okay. And the C axis, that is the, okay, yung C axis, yan yung uh, wave or axis of propagation. So if we're going to look at this, doon sa ano natin, okay. So yung propagation niya yung nandito. So that is, we could say, linear polarization. Now, let's go to the other one. The, the so-called uh, circular polarization. Okay? So if we're going to look at the circular uh, polarization, So what we have here is it arises when there are two orthogonal waves that are 90 degrees out of phase. Okay, so do you see the 90 degrees there out of phase? So if in such a case, a circularly polarized light is obtained because the resultant traces out a circle. And when the resultant vector, when the X component, so understand your X component, yeah, there. 
okay, uh, lags the Y component by 90 degrees, Celsius, uh, 90 degrees. The, uh, it results in the rotation clockwise and the resultant weight is said to be rightly circularly polarized. Okay, so as you could see, so kasan ba ang right? Ganyan. Kita niyo parang nagka-clock siya dito. Okay. So if the X component were to lead the Y component by 90 degrees, the resultant electric field would rotate counterclockwise. Okay. And uh, the resultant case we could say is said to be uh, left circularly polarized. So anong ano to? Ito yung right and uh, circular polarization. So if it's the reverse one, which is counterclockwise, you have the left hand. Now, these two opposite uh, uh, polarized components are often called the what? Ano tawag natin dyan? Yung mga sa orgo. Ito yung tinatawag natin dextro rotatory at level rotatory. So dextro is what? Yung mga orgo, specialty niya sa orgo. Ano yung dextro? Right-handed or left-handed? Anyone? Hello? <laughs> so dextro is right-handed. Okay? Tapos yung uh, isa na tinatawag nating lebo, rotatory, that is what we call left-handed. So these two uh, opposite uh, component, uh, polarized components are often called the L and the D component. So the D component is the right-handed, the L component is what we call the left-handed, yung tinatawag na counterclockwise. Okay? Now, the last that we have, is what we call the elliptical. Okay? So if we're going to look at the, what we call elliptical, what can we say? Ano yung pagkakaiba niya doon sa dalawa? Anyone? If we're going to look at the illustration here. So black screen, ba? <laughs> pag pag sinave ko kasi doon sa ano, ganit ang lalabas yung nandoon sa Kaya tawag natin yung screen ko. <laughs> Kaya sabi ko, ipapakita ko na lang. So, in the elliptical, okay, uh, if two superimposing plane polarized wave have a phase difference, phase difference between zero, which is linear uh, polarization and 90 degree, okay, uh, circular polarization, the resultant uh, traces out an ellipse and the radiation said to be elliptically polarized. I don't know if you're going to uh, see here, but elliptical is just like a combination of the two. Kaya nyo ba ima-imagine na itong elliptical na to e parang pag inag nyo yung dalawa, ito yung resulting plane polarization. Okay, if you see, see it superimpose the plane polarized that had a phase difference between zero and 90 degree angle. Kasi ito, zero degree ito, 90 degree. So if ever there's a difference in between, ang nalabas na yung tinatawag natin elliptical. Okay? So, if we're going to look at them again, when we have a linear uh, polarization, the electric field vector of the electromagnetic waves oscillate in a single plane as the wave propagates through the space. So this means that if you were to visualize the wave, the electric field vector would move back and forth in a linear uh, line, uh, in, in, uh, 
to move back and forth in a straight line along a fixed axis. So if you're going to see here, yung axis niya talaga fixed. Okay? And in addition to that, the linearly uh, polarized wave, they can further be classified into what? A horizontal polarization, okay, where the electric field oscillates in the horizontal plane, a vertical uh, polarization where the electric field oscillates in the vertical plane, or an, any uh, angle in between. Now, for the circular, this occurs when the electric field vector of the electromagnetic wave rotates in a circular motion as the wave propagates. So it can be what? Clockwise or counterclockwise, depending on the direction of the rotation as viewed by an observer so, uh, uh, looking towards the source of the wave. So in a circular polarized wave, the magnitude of the electric field remains constant, but its direction changes continuously, resulting in a helical spot. And you use circular polarization, not only in chemistry, but in other fields like astronomy, satellite communication, or antennas. Now, the last one that we have, the elliptical uh, polarization, as I told you, is just a combination of the linear and the circular polarization, where the electric field vector traces an elliptical path as the wave propagates. So this elliptical path is formed due to the unequal magnitude of the electric field components along the orthogonal axis. So depending on the specific proportion of the two orthogonal components, the resulting electrical polarization can be left-handed or right-handed, similar to the circular polarization, but with an electrical shape. Okay? So usually you use it in radar and optical uh, communication. So they, they, each of them has the unique, we could say, application. Now, Let's go with the so-called normal light. So what can you say about the normal light? Is it polarized or unpolarized? Anyone? What can you say about the normal light? <laughs> normal light ba siya or I mean is it a polarized or uh, non-polarized uh, light anyone okay so if you're going to look at the normal light this is usually electromagnetic radiation so that's not a polarized light. It's unpolarized. So light from the common uh, sources, filaments, lamp, sun, arc lamp, they're emitted by nearly independent radiators like atoms and molecules. So each of them would produce, uh, they can, each radiator can produce a polarized wave train for a short time, like 10 to the negative 8 seconds. But the light propagating in a given direction consists of many such wave trains or planes are randomly oriented around the direction propagation. So it is an unpolarized light. And when we have unpolarized light, it can be described as two orthogonal, uh, pay, play, plain polarized waves of equal amplitude with the phase difference between them that varies randomly in time. Okay? And that's where uh, we introduce this, what we call optical rotational uh, rotatory dispersion. So for some substances, we could say these characteristics of optical phenomena such as absorption, refraction, reflection depend on the polarization of the independent light. Okay, so we have this term optically active, diva. Have you heard this? Optically active? They are the one that can rotate the flame of vibration of plane polarized radiation. Is it in organic chemistry?
So we can have this so-called what? Anisotropic crystals and liquids or solutes in solution that can exist as enantiomers. So this is what we call the chiral molecule. Okay. So I know if we are being known optically active. Anyone? So when you say optically active, it's a property, okay, where certain substances can rotate the plane of polarization of the plane polarized light as it passes through them. So we have the so-called optically active substances, okay? And it has a lot of, we could say, application. So optical activity is observed with one of the enantiomers is what we call in excess. And we usually, the way we look at this is the rotation in the degrees also term, the optical rotatory power. Okay. So if we're going to look at this uh, rotation of degrees, this is just equals to what? 180 times B over the wavelength and L minus ND. So what does this mean? So what does this formula mean? What does this formula mean when we have this uh, optical uh, Rotation. So the rotation of the plane polarized light, uh, we could say by an optically active substance can be viewed as being due to the difference of the propagation rates of the D and the L component. So they deeper, the, the, the propagation uh, velocity deeper because of the different refractive index. So these are refractive index. of the D and the L component. Now, what is B here? So usually, if we're going to look at this, this is the rotation in degrees or the optical uh, rotationary, uh, rotatory dispersion or power. Rota rota rotatory power. And this is your incident radiation wavelength. So what can we say about this? So if we're going to look at this rotatory power, it depends not only on the compound, the wavelength, and the path length. The B there is the path length, okay, but also depends on the temperature and force solutions of an optically active solute, the solvent and the analyte concentration. And you can normalize the rotation to a particular path length and concentration like this one. So the specific rotation that you have there, okay? So this is the path length in decimeters, the concentration graph one. So for pure liquid, your C is replaced by this what we call density, okay? And this would lead us to two means uh, of instrument that is based on polarization. So the first one is, uh, we could say, polarimetry. 
for the so-called polarimeter. And the next one has something to do with the circular dichroism. So, who are you familiar or have used polarimeter already? Anyone? Have you used a polarimeter already? Plus? Have you used a, a polarimeter? <laughs> Or have you seen what a polarimeter looks like? Uh, that, that because uh, polarimeter, I think that's one of the cheapest uh, instrument that you can buy. Okay, I only use it once. And it's just like a, what we call some sort of a holder. So I try to see if I can show you some uh, polarimeter. So if you're going to look at this, I think I put in in the next slide. So this is how it looks like. So the way that, that you have a polarimeter, just like any uh, optical devices, okay, you have uh, a light source. You always have a light source in, in these uh, optical devices that we have, okay. And then the way that you're going to what we call work, if you have this what we call light source, right? So what usually uh, the light that comes there looks like. So you could say at every direction, right? So it passed through a polarizer, okay? So if you have a polarizer, what happens? So your light after passing through that will just be in this plane, okay? And then there is some sort of a tube that you have there okay so there's a tube there like this and then that one has that one so what happens if you put your sample here if it's able to rotate okay uh the light there so you can say that this what optically active so you have a polarizer, it passed through there, and then it's going to rotate there. And then you have some sort of a analyzer, some sort of a detector, a rotatable uh, polarizer to determine how uh, the rotation would look like. Uh, usually, if you are, are going to look how an instrument works, my suggestion to you is look at this, what we call company that sell um, this instrument, okay? Because they usually have a, 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 what we call simple explanation. And I think you can go over about what a poly polarimeter is. So I, I, I use this, uh, what we call company, because if you're going to look at it, do you see it? Okay, so, See what happened? So you have the light source here. So it is unpolarized. So it has a polarizer there. So it uh, passed, if the light source passed through the polarizer, it just passed through the one that is there. And from that polarizer, it will go here. Okay. So 
is pass through a filter. And then the next thing that we're going to do, if you have the tube here, so it will be able to rotate your sample here. So initially it's like here, but when you go here, it's in this form. And then you're going to do here. So if you have an optically active substance, okay, it will be able to what we call the have the rotation of the thing. And then you monitor it through uh, what we call an analyzer like, like this one. So how much of the thing was we call the rotated based on this. And, and the good thing about this is it, it, it gives you an example here. Okay. Now you may ask yourself why it's very important. I don't know if you know the history of thalidomide. It's always the classic example of uh, the different activity of the L and D isomers that it has. Because usually it is what? It, it has what we call the different activity based on uh, the version that it has. So before they said they use it for sleeping pills, but they found out that one of the enantiomers has what a teraton, a teratogenic effect. So if you're going to mix it or if you're going to use it while you're pregnant, what happened is there will be some effect on uh, malformation, okay? for the kids that they have there. So that's one thing that they ex uh, use this, what we call polarimeter. So if you're going to look at this, so this is how it is, okay? So usually when I try to uh, see how an instrument works, I usually do to some uh, go to the website of some company because uh, their sales representative, they are trained to at least explain to the customer the product that they're selling. So this is how, what happened there in your uh, tube that you have. It, I think, so quite uh, cheap, but the thing is that uh, there's a limited uh, application for it. So unless you are in the pharmaceutical, okay, you, you, you can use it to this. So in addition to that, they use it in this, or what we call different industry. And the way that they look is for the purity and concentration of ingredients in uh, pharmaceutical products. So one, that's one, uh, we could say product from polarimeter. Now the other one is the circular dichroism. So this is depends on the molar absorptivity for the D and the L component, okay, by optically active material. Now, if an absorbing sample of optically active compound is illuminated with the flame polarized radiation, the differential absorption results in one of the circularly polarized components being absorbed more strongly than the other component. So if you're going to look at this, TD is what? Elliptically polarized. It's the uh, transmitted radiation is elliptically polarized. Okay, and if you're going to look at that, the eccentricity of the ellipse can be characterized uh, by the quantity uh, term as ellipticity, like that one in degrees. And it's a measure of the magnitude of CD, and it's related to the length of the major and the minor axis of the ellipse. And uh, ellipticity is not directly measured as the optical rotation. Okay. Is this the first time for you to hear CD, circular dichroism? Where do you usually use that? Although it's mentioned here as optically rotation, but there is one unique aspect where CD is used. Anyone? Anyone who are in biochem here? <laughs> Okay. 
plus peptide. So what do you look at the peptide? If you read some of the articles of mine in peptide, uh, we use it. Usually, what do we usually use it for? So usually, w what happened here, so in circular di dichroism, okay? Rather, the absorbance with incident radiation that is circularly polarized in the D direction and the absorbance with L circularly polarized direction are separately measured. And the electricity is calculated from these absorbances and equation. And we're going to look at this. This is how you look at it. Okay? But its application has been, we could say, different. Uh, take a From what it is before. Okay, so you use it in proteins, byun. Yung primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary, something. Ano yung merong tinatawag na beta sheet sa ka alpha helix? Is that the secondary structure? So that's why we use it. Okay. So its uh, use uh, has been what we call not really in optical uh, direction, uh, optical rotation. That's what it is way back uh, before. Okay. So usually it studied the structural properties of chiral molecules. It's still the chiral molecules. Uh, particularly the proteins and look like acids and other optically active compounds. But the one that it provides information is anong tawag doon? Conformation? Okay. Secondary structure and molecular conformation. So if, if you're going to look at this, okay, they just base this reading uh, on the difference in the absorption of the left handed and the right handed polarized light. So CD is just what? Taking advantage of the difference in the absorbance of the left and the right circularly polarized light by the chiral molecules. The chiral uh, molecules interact differently with these two forms of light due to their asymmetric path, uh, structure leading to their different absorption. So usually, what do you have in, in a CD? Again, you have a light source. Uh, 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 I'm lucky to have it, okay, because there are two CDs in the lab of, of, of my, uh, what we call postdoc advisor, okay. And, and the good thing about the CD, once you want to measure, let's say, the absorbance and then the emission, okay, we can go to the Raman and then get some samples for the IR and then go to what we call the CD. So if you're going to look at the thing that is happening here, so this is how the light is polarized in two directions. Do you see the red and the green thing? So it's still, we could say, polarization, okay, as uh, uh, we know it. So 
So it's very useful to determine the molecular uh, conformation. I'm not sure if someone has a CV there. I know before in UC Biliman, there's a faculty, but he left already, uh, Dr. James Villanueva. He had a CD uh, spectrofluorimeter. So usually if you are in biochemistry, you need this one. How expensive it is? I'm not sure. Okay. And then, we go on the other part, the modulators. So if you have what we call the modulator, so by the name itself, it's responsible for the modulation. But the question is, what does it modulate? So based on our slide here, it modulates the radiation spectrum. So when you have a modulator, what it do is uh, based on mechanical interruption of a light beam or an electro optic magneto magneto optic or acoustic optic phenomena. So you can have a chopper like you have here. So you have here a rotating wheel or a disc chopper. So it has this for a tooth mill chopper that is usually used. And then you can also have a high quality motor that's used to control the rotation rate of the wheel. But this is the old model, okay? So why do you think it's a chopper? So if you rotate it, lights in, lights out, lights in, lights out. That, that's what it usually do. So it modulates the entry of your what we call light source. So there's a periodic interruption of the light beam uh, it's also, we could say, a means to control them, okay? And in this, uh, what we call modulators, we can include here the mechanical choppers. So you have a maximum mod mo modulation frequency from a mechanical chopper from what? 1 to 10 kilohertz. So how are you going to describe the one and that's 10 kilohertz. So compare it like this to this one. So which has a higher frequency? The A or the B? Which has the higher frequency? Okay, usually the A. So you just imagine so if it's a chopper, so if it's a higher frequency, mobilis yung paggalaw niya. Kesa doon sa isa na, kesa yun. Okay. So there are choppers that can be designed to 10 to 600 hertz. Okay. And they can be used for specialized gratings by mounting the mirrors, uh, refractor plates, gratings, or filters to the beam. So you can have a chopper with a mirrored base that is commonly used as a chopping beam splitter. Okay. And then in some applications only necessary to block or unblock a radiation beam at certain times in an experiment to measure the dark signal. So beam blocking can be uh, accomplished by pulling a beam in and out of the light path. Okay. So Included in this is the so-called imaging and beam directing optics. Okay, so this produces an image or set of uh, images on the entrance lid on the focal plane. So what they do, they collect and focus radiation from external source into a sample container and then radiation from the container into a filter or entrance lid of a monochromator. So usually, what do you use here are lenses and mirrors. So we're just going here now to some parts that you have. Okay, so remember, when we're talking about optics, we're talking about what? Optics is the study of what?
Anyone? Behavior of what? Doon sa mga nag-agchem. You still have, uh, is that P623? It's the behavior of what we call light. Okay? So when you have light, so that means you can have diffraction rating, lenses, mirrors, prism, so other stuff that you have. But before we go there, we discuss this so-called aberration, chromatic aberration. So what do you think is this? Aberration. So what is aberration? What's the meaning of this so-called aberration? So for instance, okay, if we're going to look at the lens, Okay, or let's say if we're going to look like uh, through a lens, like a pair of glasses or a camera, there are some aberrations that you're going to what we call observe. What is this aberration? I don't know if you notice it. Sometimes you see like you have some rainbow around the edges. So what happened usually there? So when when the light passes through a lens, like the one that we have in our glasses, in the camera, it can what? Reflect and refract, right? But different colors, they uh, reflect differently. So when all the colors come together, okay, after passing through the lens, they don't all focus on the same point. So instead, they spread out a little bit to create some fuzzy or uh, blurry edges. Okay? So imagine you're trying to look at the uh, apple. So what's the color of the apple? Red, right? Uh, through a lens. So if you see chromatic, uh, if there's a chromatic aberration there, okay, the edges of the apple might look like different colors. So maybe what? Blue. Purple, okay, because what happened, the, the red lights and the blue lights, they don't come together per perfectly, okay? So what the chromatic aberration do is it can make things look less sharp or less clear, especially towards the edges, uh, what you're looking at. It's something that we could say the lens designers work hard to minimize so you get a clearer and sharper images okay so if you're going to look at this uh, chromatic aberration the equation that we have here uh for the focal length of a thin lens is this so the focal length is just equal to refractive index minus one times one over the radius of curvature minus one over the radius the second radius that you have. So for example if you have a few silica it has a refractive index of this at this wavelength and this at this wavelength. So since the focal length is inversely proportional to the n minus 1, so the focal length of a few cents will be 2.4% longer at 589 nanometer compared at 404.7 nanometer. So in general, we could say uh, the focal length okay, decreases with decreasing wavelength. So this chromatic aberration, this is a problem uh, if the optical system is aligned and optimized with the visible light and the system is later used in the ultraviolet region. Kasi iba yung ano nila doon, wavelength. Okay. So dramatic effects on the size and quality of the image and on the throughput can result. I told you, chromatic aberrations, they make the images less sharp and less clear. 
Now, you can have aberrations along the optical axis. They're termed axial chromatic uh, uh, aberrations, while in the vertical direction, they are termed lateral chromatic aberrations. Okay? Now, you can compensate this but a two wavelengths by using a combination of a positive and a negative lens called a chromatic doublet. Now, unfortunately, the achromatic lenses are what? Expensive and impractical in the UV region of the spectrum. So the compensation at wide, uh, one wavelength in, in the red and another in the blue person is achieved by selecting glasses of appropriate refractive index and choosing the radii of curvature to give the same focal length at the two wavelengths. Have you encountered this uh, term before? Chromatic aberration. Class, is this first time for you? Oh, so this is not uh, new to you. Okay. Yeah, I think I encountered it with uh, Chem 23 before. I don't know if there's still a teacher by the name, uh, by the last name of Vallejo. I think that's, that's the teacher that I have before, okay? So we can also have this, what we call monochromatic aberration. So what do you think is this monochromatic aberration? It is focused only on one wavelength, okay? So what happens when you have a monochromatic aberration? So both lenses and mirrors suffer from aberrations even when the incident light is monochromatic. So you can have this so-called spherical aberrations as a result of deviation from the paraxial approximation. So for converging uh, elements, the off-axis rays are focused closer to the element than the paraxial rays as demonstrated here in the what we call in the slide that you have here. So these are what we call the spherical aberration. But uh one method to reduce this uh, spherical uh, aberration is to put an aperture stop in front of or behind the lens so that the off-axis rays are black. And you can have deviations, okay? Uh, they, the, uh, they, they are reduced if the lens is used as illustrated in the figure. So if you're going to look at here, so you have here what? Parallel rays are seen to produce a circle in the focal plane. So you call it the circle of this confusion due to spherical aberration. Now here, there's is what? Deviations are reduced if the incident rate makes nearly the same angle with the surface as the exiting ray as shown here. So we could say uh, the image quality is improved through the reduction of uh, spherical aberration by the use of spherical optical component. Okay. So look at the difference. Here you put that one, and they have different what? <laughs> List of confusion. And then here, when you do it, they focus on one thing here. So you can have the concave, parabolic, ellipsoidal, and hyperboloidal mirrors form perfect images for pairs of conjugate actual points. So this is what we call the aberration. So we could say spherical aberration, they occur when the light rays passing through different parts of the lens or the optical system focus at different points leading to blurring, uh, blurredness or fuzziness in the image. Just like if you focus the camera, the edges are what we call blurry, even when the center is what we call sharp. But I think you don't focus your camera now because everything is automatic. 
Okay. Now, the next thing that we're going to talk is the splitters. What does the splitters do? Again, from the word itself, okay, they usually split your light. So from one light source, they can split it into two. Okay. So many applications spectroscopy call for one beam to split into two beams. I don't know if we still have the double beam spectrometer. We have a single beam and then we have a double beam. So if you're going to look at the single beam, it's just one light source for your sample. Now, if you have the double beam, you, you have like a splitter, okay? So one goes there and one goes there and you split the thing. So this is like a reference and this one is what? The blind. So that's your uh, double beam. So the one that we uh, accomplish this stuff is the so-called beam splitter. Okay, and one simple beam, uh, not, that's not pattern, that should be splitter, is based on the one that's shown here. So if you're going to look at here, this is the incident beam. So one will be transmitted and the other one will go there. Now sometimes there's still another thing here, like a mirror or lenses that will go here. So your sample is here and then maybe like the blank is here. So we could say this type of mirror is partially transparent because the metallic coating is too thin to make it opaque. Okay, so there's a coating that you have there. So with such a mirror, one can look both through it and see a reflection simultaneously. Okay, and the beam is usually split into two beams separated, it's partially but temporarily overlapping. Now, there are other, we could say, uh, beam that we have. So we also have the so-called pellicle beam splitter. So these are made from thin nitrocellulose. That's why, uh, uh, if I recall, during my time, when you had the 137.1, uh, we usually use the old or junk instrument and we open it to let the student uh, see what is inside okay, the instrument so that they will have an idea of what these instruments are made up of. So usually it's just... Uh, a network or we could say a system of glasses and lenses. Even here, when we use what we call the laser, we just use what we call different uh, system of glasses and uh, lenses that we have. So if we're going to look at this, uh, Pellicle beam splitter, they are, as I told you, they are made up from very thin nitrocellulose membranes stretched over a metallic uh, frame. Okay. And then we also have, oh, if you're going to look at this, okay, uh, a chopper beam splitter. So it's a combination of a beam splitter and a chopper. So you can see the chopper that you have here. It's like there's a mirror and then there's what? An open one. So the way that it do, okay, one time it's going to uh, reflect the light source to another direction. And then if we open one, it passes through. So it's just like that sequence that they have. So those are the old models of this, uh, what you call spectrometer. And then we have the so-called fiber optics. So fiber optics is uh, based on what? Is that internal reflection? 
So they use it in spectrometer to transfer light between various points. So right now, the fiber optics are the one that is usually being used. Okay, it makes the instrumentation cheaper if you use uh, a fiber optics. So in this fiber optics that we have here, so you have here the light source. Okay, so you pass it through there, just reflect there. So this fiber optics is consists of a core of a refractive index one and a club of uh, material that is refractive okay. index two, where N one is always. Now usually the additional jackets that are used here to provide additional strength. So usually, as I told you, the principle of fiber optics is just the total internal reflection. Okay, so in the total uh, internal reflection, we have the refractive index time. It's lower or less than this. And if you're going to look at this, the light entering the core, okay, so the maximum value that you can get here is for which your total internal uh, reflection, of course, is given by this, but instead of less than or equal, it should be equal. And the ray incident at larger angles are only partially reflected at the four clad interface and soon pass out of the fiber. Now, if you're going to look at this, uh, what we call uh, numerical aperture, that's the kind of light accepted by the fiber. Okay, numerical aperture. <laughs> so, it, when we have this numerical aperture, this is usually the term used to describe the light emitting or light gathering ability and resolving power of an optical system, such as a microscope objective or a lens. Now, why do we use fiber optics in spectroscopy? So usually these are what we call the reason. It's mechanically flexible. Okay, it's just like a wire. Okay, uh, the light can be transmitted over curved path. Uh, it can replace the several mirrors in directing rays, uh, light rays in a spectrometer. So source to monochromator and then detector. And the light can be transmitted over long distance, around 500 meter. That allows remote monitoring in hazardous environment since the more delicate components can be far from the monitoring side. So we could say if we have the so-called portable devices, most likely its light source is a fiber optic. Hindi lang yan sa phone, okay? And the thing is, the, 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 the only problem with this is a single fiber optic cannot transmit an image because the rays from different parts of the object are scrambled by multiple internal reflection. So hanggang ano lang siya, yung signal lang niya, hindi siya kaya mag-transmit ng image. And then we go uh, maybe to this group of uh, components, optical components, the filters, the prisms and the gratings. Okay, so we go first with the filters. So what the filters do is they attenuate all but the desired wavelength. And there are different filters that we're going to discuss. Okay, so whenever we have what we call the light, usually uh, filters is usually involved. Okay. So when we have this, what we call the filters, they can also act as a wavelength selector. Okay. So higher resolution system works on the basis of what? Dispersing or spreading out of the wavelength partially. 
okay, uh, radiation in the spectrum. And you use filters to pass a band of wavelength, like the band pass filters, or to block uh, wavelength longer or shorter than some desired value. What's the common filters that we usually use in our everyday life? Ano yung filters na ginagamit natin? Di ba ang tawag dito? Yung blue light ba yun? Blue filter? If you are in front of the computer. Okay. Or the sunglass. That's a filter. It filter out the UV. Okay. So, most likely your filters are what? They simple, rugged, no moving parts in general. They are cheap, relatively inexpensive. They can select some broad range of, we could say, wavelengths and most often used in field instrument and simpler instrument or instrument dedicated to monitoring a, a single wavelength. So usually how many filters do I have here? The one that I put. Did I put three? Dapat tatlo. Interference or the lawala na lagay ko band pass yung isa. Okay, so we go with the absorption filters. So this is based on the absorption of colored glass, crystal solutions, and tinsel. So these types of filters usually what? Okay, they absorb most of the incident wavelength. and transmit a bond of wavelength. Now, when we're using laser, usually we use filter. Why? Why do you think we use like a specialized filter when we use laser? Because we try to protect our eye so that any incident light coming from the filter will be absorbed by the filter, okay? So they are cheap and they can be simple as uh, what, colored glasses or plastic, okay? They are inactive to the angle of incident. So, some of them can be what we call the bandpass filter. So if you have this bandpass filter, so you have this uh, what we call uh, wavelength that fine. So this is the maximum transmittance. So we could say this is your nominal wavelength where you have your highest transmittance, percent transmittance. And this is the F, uh, FWHM, as they call it. Okay, full width at half maximum height. And then you have here the wavelength of your uh, maximum transmittance or your lambda max. So here we could say uh, you transmit a band of wavelengths in an effective bandwidth in the range of, let's say, 30 to 250 nanometer. So the transmittance is usually low, only about 10 to 20% of incident light is transmitted. Okay. So if you look at the effective bandwidth of the absorption, uh, what we call filter, okay, it's just effective around what? 50 nanometer. So it depends. So if it's usually like this one, okay. Uh, this is usually for the interference filter, but for this one, the cut of that you have, so you see this thing, the cut of filter, so it contains a substance that absorbs all radiation shorter than the given cut of to here. So it will not pass through all of them before. So if this is the thing, so the cut of is here. So anything below this wavelength, the filter will cut it. That's why it's useful in uh, when you're using what we call laser. Okay. So the cut of filters that we have here, it passes high wavelengths, but uh, blocks the low wavelength. 
Okay, so this is a type of filter that can be used for emission or fluorescence. Because you just try to what we call monitor the one that is emitted. Anything that is lower than the emission wavelength, usually they are stronger uh, in energy. So you don't want to what we call use it. And then we have the interference filter. So they are constructed so that the rays from the most wavelengths that strike the filter suffer destructive interference while only rays with small wavelength band experience constructive interference and pass. Okay. So if you have what we call interference uh, filters, what they usually do is uh, it can make the light or incident like uh, reflect, and some of them transmit the light that reflects off. Okay, so it interferes with uh, what we call the light that you have. So the filters that you have here are, we could say, characterized by the wavelength of the transmittance peak, the percentage of the incident peak that they have. So do you have a single layer or the fabry type or the multi-layer uh, dielectric type of filter? So I think I have some example here of this what we call fabry uh, type of this what we call filter. So usually if you're going to look at this type of filters, they are made up of what? You have a dielectric space in between two films. So this could be a metal, this could be what we call the glass. Okay? So if you're going to look at this uh, interaction here, so the ray one would travel the path ABE. Okay, so you have A, you have B, and then you have what we call E. Well, the ray two that you have there travels up at A, B, E, and what? F. Okay, so before it goes to the G there, so it goes here to do that group there. So one just goes straight here, the other one has to be uh, what we call this, reflected going here and then reflected going here before it goes here, before you see them in the, what we call that. So the two waves that you have there will be in phase. So it's a constructive interference at point G and E. So they are integral multiple of the wavelength. That's the condition for the uh, constructive interference is given by this equation. Now, in many uses of your refract, uh, in uh, Interference filters, usually the incident beam is normal to the flame of the filter instead of a skewed as in the what we call previous figure. And in these cases, okay, so <clears throat> the uh, this uh, theta here is equal to zero angle, so that the sine theta is just equal to zero. And the central wave that passed by the filter the wavelength m can be written as this one okay so this is just what we call the order now for the other one just try to no uh the typical the uh, transmission of a typical fabry ferro is interfer interference filter so if you have here so the first order that you have is 720. so if you put the second order of that that's what divided by two okay now, if you put a third order, what would it be? 720 divided by 3. What would that be equal to? So this is what we call the interference filter uh, 2. So it's going to what we call narrow it, okay, in terms of this, what we call the order that you have. Now, the multi-layer or multi-cavity uh, filters, they are made up of alternating layers of high and low refractive index. And they are considered to be what? Multiple fabry ferrota cavity cemented together. So parang pinagsama mo lang itong mga filter ito. So may ganyan. It's just a repeating uh, what you could think of this one. Okay, 
And the multi-lane circumference can achieve quite narrow FWHM, which is less than one nanometer with thick transmitters at 50 degree angle. And then the single multi-cavity filters that are usually available with the thick transmitters in the UV to the IR, okay? But the one that is commonly used is the first one, this one. So I think uh, I'll end here and then we will continue uh, with the prism, the gratings, monochromator, and then we will continue on with the next chapter with the other components of the optical instrument. Now, I hope you submitted already your what we call a pick, because the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to start writing the outline, especially for those papers that you have. And I'm going to post the requirements on how to write the critique. Okay, so hopefully I can post it in the Google Classroom by um, before the end of the week. Okay, because we have how many? Two more weeks before your break. During Holy Week, pareho ba tayong araw hindi magmeet? Wednesday, Friday, or Friday lang? Anyone? Friday lang po ata sir kasi may pasok pa po usually